things that were things. So back in the day, this, and this place was locked today because it's security. Everybody needs security now. And probably reasons for it. But the old days, it wasn't quite as much security. <laughs> in fact, I'm the one that opened the door when I was a sophomore. I only started here as a sophomore. Ninth grader, you didn't come to high school, you were in junior high. So I had a key to this school, to that door, and to that locker room. Because I lived across the street, and because I could be the first one here at 6.30 in the morning to open up the door, to be able to come inside this gym, or to go downstairs, down in the wrestling facility, and work out. And I was the only one here. Uh, even though we had good teams, great teams, winning state championships with Coach Bob Siddons, it was still nobody was coming in the mornings until a kid across the street lived there and didn't know any better because that's how I've been raised in the YMCA right up till 10th grade here, the work ethic, and all of a sudden, you know, I open that door and I go, go in there and I come out and I ran around this gym a lot. I ran around the gym a lot, do pull-ups, a shadow wrestle. I go down to the wrestling room, do a lot of shadow wrestling and do a lot of exercises down there on my own. Because you got a lot of wrestle by yourself as well. And then I was 1-0. I made the team as a sophomore. I was 1-0, and then I was 2-0, and 3-0, 4-0, 5-0, 6-0, 7-0, 8-0, 9-0, and all of a sudden, I'm opening the door at 6.30 in the morning, and I'm opening the door, and I walk, and somebody bumps into me. I affected one of the teammates, because he was there before, but he wasn't going to do it until he saw what kind of success that I was having as a sophomore. And so then all of a sudden he, he was following me and then all of a sudden that streak kept going and all of a sudden that guy started getting a little bit better and then all of a sudden there was two guys and there was three guys and four guys. By the middle of the season we had the whole team coming in in the mornings as well. You know, not the day before the match or the day of the match, that type of stuff. You've got to be smart. You've got to understand peaking and all that kind of stuff. But that was probably uh, One of the some of the greatest times you know in, in history in the sport here with people wrestling. They already had good time for people to go to the highest level. And obviously, he got an example, and he was a good example because he was being successful. If you do all this and don't, if you're not successful, then other people are going to say, "Well, why would why would I want to do all that?" You know, but it does take a lot of that work before you start getting successful. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. More than you think. So all of a sudden, I uh, hate to tell you this as well, but all of a sudden maybe during my study halls. they have study halls in high school anymore? Do they? I don't know. I don't know if they do that or not. During the day you get to actually have a, you go to the library and you get to sit there and do homework. Do you guys do that? Yeah. Okay, well, I, I always had a pass out of the study hall. To be able to come down here, change clothes, go downstairs. But it was always, the study hall was always like before noon, like 11 o'clock. So I'd be over here, 6.30 in the morning. Then at, at noon, or 11 o'clock, I would come back down. And usually the one at... at, at um, at 11 o'clock, I would actually go to the wrestling room more and do like dummy throwing, uh, hip heist, stance in motion. You know, once somebody else, I could get somebody else to, to follow me. I had two guys, we could actually drill hard and stuff like that. Because I didn't want to go too much because we're going to have practice at 3.30, and that's the main thing. If I had study hall at 2 o'clock, I wouldn't have went out of that because I want to be ready for the main, the main time, which is 3.30. So, you know, that's kind of a, a daily basis routine. Believe it or not, even at night when I lived across the street, 
for some reason, I recovered quickly. And there's a reason why I recovered quickly, because I was doing things to make you recover quickly. I didn't know, understand it, no, he was telling me that. I mean, maybe the high school coach didn't. That's why he's got his name on it. Maybe I had to, you know, he's telling me how to recover. And so there's not, there's not a time that I got done wrestling that within the next hour I was back to normal. And so at night, even like at 8 o'clock, I'd probably get another little workout. I'd either go out and run at night, and, or I would do some weightlifting uh, in the basement of my home. So that's, sometimes you'd go once, twice, three, four times a day sometimes. Not every day, but quite a, quite a few times. But I also had the energy, and that energy was because I recovered well. Recovered well. A lot of hot water, a lot of cold water. Didn't realize that we had this little uh, whirlpool in here. After practice, when I got done, I was the last guy there, I used to jump in that hot whirlpool. It was pretty hot. It felt good because it was like a massage. And then I'd go into the cold showers, let the cold water hit me. And, and all of a sudden, I'd go back and forth and spend, I'd, everybody else would be gone, I'd still be here 45 minutes after everybody else was gone, or an hour. And all of a sudden, it was time to go home, and I'd walk home. And by the time I got home, I was ready to eat, ready to drink and felt good, but I already had three workouts in. And a lot of times that fourth one would even would even come. All because what I was doing after practice to recover. Cool down, drink some water, get ice, you know, jump in a cold plunge, get under the hot showers, uh, that type of stuff. You know, all through college I did it with whirlpools, saunas, uh, steam rooms, some of that stuff. They, won't, they don't even let us use it because you guys uh, they think that's going to abuse something like that. But you got to be educated. You got to learn what you need to do. If you don't know what you need to do, then you need to talk to somebody that knows what you need to do. Your coach, or more than even that, somebody that really understands really who you are individually. Because if this is my team, I can't treat everyone any the same. And if you, if I do, even though we have a same similar practice then I'm, I'm realizing that, my gosh, you're, you're, you're really good on your feet, but you can't get out. And so if I'm having a practice where I'm on the feet all the time, I'm really probably not helping you as much as I should be that day. So maybe you have to stay after and know that you have to do that, or maybe you get a good enough workout to, where you can escape and escape and escape. Because if you can't take anybody down, you can't escape, you haven't got the two fundamentals that you need to have in this sport. You need to have that in this sport. No matter if it's Collegiate, scholastic, or international wrestling. They're all very important. The down position underneath, that defense, which is the opposite for escaping, but you still need that good transition, knowing how to move. So uh, it's all similar. So anyway, so I had to cross the street, and the team was already good, but they just became that much better. And a lot of those kids uh, went on to wrestle in college, and so on and so forth. But it takes time, and a lot of times you do something once or twice or three times, and you, ah, I'm not really, it's not really for me. But you know, you got to do it for 30 times, 35, 40 times. Get used to it. Actually, get some rewards out of it. Recover well. And then all of a sudden, you do something like that, it might affect the rest of your life. You know how it can affect the rest of your life? Look at that statue right there. That's only one of three statues in this state. But you know what's really more important than that? How you live your life with your kids and your wife and how you treat everybody. And I, I got four daughters and every one of them is uh, different. And if I treat them all the same, it'd be like a wrestling team. I'd be hurting them, giving them not the best opportunity for what they need. So now I got 12 grandkids and I probably think all 12 of them are probably a little bit different and unique. And I have to get to know them. So these coaches that are here, you got to get to know these guys, and you don't want you don't want to waste a whole lot of time on somebody in a practice where you're getting so much efficiency out of the whole team when you're helping every kid in that practice. And usually you do some things in every area that's going to help anyway. But a lot of times kids don't want to wrestle in their bad areas; they only want to wrestle in their good areas. And like I said, it's really it's simplicity. You only need to be good on feet and be good underneath. But you know what? That's not for everybody, because this guy over here, you're just a, a hellion on top with your legs, you know? And I, I don't know if you are, but, but, you know, and so guess what? 
I know you want to wrestle there in practice because that's where you're best at. And I want you to some too. But you know what? You have never escaped in your life yet. So I need to work with you a lot on the bottom just because that's one of the two areas. Your area is kind of a bonus. Guess what, guess what I was toughest at? On top, in control. Riding and pinning. That's where I was. And I had to make some adjustments. Even though I was okay on the other positions, I realized if I was going to be a world and Olympic caliber wrestler, that I had to get good on my feet, better on my feet. And so uh, sometimes it takes a loss or adversity to set you back a little bit, but everybody has it. Everybody has it. You don't want to have too many. You want to have as little as you can. So anyway, and the only other things I want to kind of talk about was actually the nutrition path part, the aspect of making weight. You know, when you when you once you get your weight down, you can shave a little bit. You should be down to weight every day, underweight when you leave practice. But that doesn't mean you might not have to lose some weight. You might be out of your weight class, or you, maybe you want to go to a certain weight class. You got to do it the right way. You got to get educated, just like you got to learn wrestling. You got to talk to somebody that knows how to do that. Chances are your coach knows how to do that, and that's just a good nutrition book textbook. But a lot of times you're coming off one sport and you have to do something quick, and so sometimes you got to be a little. Be a little bit, um, not extreme, but a little bit more than uh, the general textbook message. And uh, anyway, so for me, it was like uh, I, I first thought you had to be unbelievably disciplined and not, you just had an unbelievable diet and all that kind of stuff. From, from a nutritional point of view, well, I did that at first, my first year in high school. But then I said, you know what? I kind of miss this kind of stuff, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so all of a sudden I said, I want to get tough enough that it doesn't make a difference exactly if I go ahead and maybe drink a Mountain Dew or something. So I, that was part of my goal, be tough enough that I can drink a Mountain Dew and still win. Because I'm kicking butt. And one of the reasons why I say that is because the guy on, the, on this uh, gymnasium was Bob Sittens, and our way in drink was Gatorade and Mountain Dew. I don't know if he knew the dew was in there, <laughs> but I didn't know he didn't know it. <laughs> One of my wrestlers, I think, was sneaking some dew in there. Tasted damn good. <laughs> and guess what? We were kicking butt. And if you get tough enough, I always, I told early on my athletes, I remember I telling the Bannings, uh, they were unbelievable wrestlers for me. One goals in the, because they were after weigh-ins, they wanted big stakes. And I said, you know, you shouldn't really have that after weigh-in. But I said, if you prove it, you, I'll, you go ahead and order that statement. Well, they proved it. <laughs> they won five national titles. And, uh, you know, they weren't perfect, so they needed a little guidance. I might add back them off a little bit here and there. But if you can prove yourself, you know, that's the biggest thing you can do for the team. So anyway, it's pretty much, pretty much, we'll go on to the, oh, are you taping me? <laughs> You didn't tell me. You okay with this? I'm okay with it. You okay with it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would have been more animated. <laughs> I would have did a better job if I didn't know when I was on the show. Just kidding. I'm all right. I like this guy. <laughs> Track wrestling, right? Yep. And Andy Hamilton. Good man. I think he used to follow me earlier in my career, too. How early? 1980, four years old. Look at that guy. NCAA Championships, Corvallis, Oregon. Ooh. Let me think. It was a pretty good one, actually. We had a, we, I think we had almost a brand new team at different weight classes, and we still won it. But I think it was a crazy night, if I remember right. But it was a good day the next day because we had the, the, the basketball team was made the final four, right? Yeah. And we won the Nationals, and we came to an event at, at – uh, at the field house, celebration, we won. We've always gotten those before, and we usually get five, 6,000 people. Capacity, 13,000 people. But it wasn't it was because of the basketball. But, they, but, they, but they, got, they got beat in the first round. We'd won the Nationals. <laughs> I do remember, because I stood up on a chair, fell through the chair, because it folded, and everybody in there thought I was a little tippy. <laughs> Which, I don't think I was. On Duke, I don't think so. But anyway. Okay, so anybody have any questions, coaches, or I really wasn't going to do this speech somewhere else. I think, right? 
Where's Kyle? Yeah, you, you covered it here. Did I feel okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, I used to live just right across the street here. I drove by there not too long ago, kind of like peeking in at the place. The guy, they came out and they got mad at me. They thought I was kind of uh, snooping around too much. I tried to tell them. But I was going to write him a check, see if I could uh, just tour the house. Anyway. Coach, how many kids came out in 62, 63? Okay, guys were in the wrestling room here today, right? Nope. No, 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 we're out here in, oh, you were? in the gym. Nobody saw the wrestling room. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, yeah. few people did. It's, you know, it's it's a mat and a half or two mats. Mat and a half. Mat and a half. So it's forty by forty plus another twenty by twenty, so it's sixty by sixty, something like that. But that was the wrestling room. Outside the wrestling room, there was a big gymnasium type. Right now, it's all built up you, walls. And you, and there's no place to go. It was just a big gym. So a gym like this, outside the wrestling room. And we had mats down there, too. And so the top 30, I think, correct? Yeah. Top 30 got to wrestle in the wrestling room. And the other 70 wrestled outside the wrestling room, where we had, uh, uh, and here's the thing. Probably more than 100 people would come out Every kid wanted to come, and again, it was only boys then. Now it's boys and girls, and we got a long ways to go yet, but, but the thing about it is the high school coach was doing such a good job, Coach Siddons, that every, a lot, almost every kid wanted their kid to try wrestling. He don't try it anyway, but he wanted to be involved because of what he could take home with him and what he would learn, and how much of a better kid he would be. And that's really critical with coaches and performers that uh, would deal with kids. Because it's, it's, yeah, we can teach you a lot of wrestling, but we're going to teach you disciplines that are there forever, and you better be better because of that. That's real crucial. And that's why all the parents, and we got a tough town here. Why is a tough town? I just went to East Waterloo. I just went to East Waterloo the other day, and I for the sophomore baseball game. City, I beat them 25 to 1 and 32 to nothing in three innings of each game. But I didn't realize they didn't have a coach and they didn't practice. <laughs> so well, what do you do? I mean, you still offer the opportunity, but we still got a long ways to go probably to make sure that we provide young people like you guys opportunities. This is pretty unique for you guys to be here. Probably pretty unique. You got to thank your coaches for bringing you down from Michigan and from Sioux City as well. Because, uh, I mean, especially for wrestling, it's pretty unique. You know, being able to be here and see where lots of champions, you, and you might want to see the wrestling before you leave, too. It's a lot, it's not any bigger than when I was, when I was here. The actual the wrestling room where the top 30 would wrestle. And you had to earn your way in there. You tried to get into the top 30 and knock somebody out of there. But it was, uh, it was good, so... Anyway, you might want to just look at that, but it is, it is a lot better. I mean, when I wrestled there, it was plastic-covered mats uh, for a majority of it, plastic-covered. Get, get a few scrapes. So anyway, we've got some good people here today, and, and uh, we, we have a museum. Kyle's got this group together. We've got Mike Doty, fund, fund event director, and, and um, Kyle Klingman. We've got the high school coaches, Alex Dolly. Uh, we got we got good news here. We got track wrestling. We got KWBL. Who else we got? We got Courier, Nelson here. So, uh, oh, we got we got this guy here. He came all the way from uh, Craig Schweinbart and his wife. I'm not in here. Probably work here. He's my coach in high school. One of them. Yeah. Oh wow. <coughs> I mean, and that was at Conrad, right? Conrad, Iowa. Probably don't even know where that is, but I do. It's not too far from here. Um, but, you, but you know, you got people. You got a lot of people right here. This is good for the sport, promoting the sport, getting you guys better, getting these coaches in the same room. You got sponsors here. This guy was a state champion wrestler in his day, and he had and he, when he got beat in the state finals, he lost to some guy that was pretty tough, second in the world, a guy named Royce Elger, 
if you don't know his name, look him up. I don't know if I want you, I don't know if you're following on social media or not. <laughs> My wife won't even follow that. So you know, you gotta watch that. But this guy, you know, he's uh he's a contributor. We're renovating and he just likes he's trying to get a, this company going too and he he wants to put effort into the sport, but he also knows that if he uh if you guys do a good job and get some good promotion, it might help his company as well. So anyway, and the athletic director was here a little while ago. I don't know if he's still here. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, anybody else want to ask anything? Hey, Coach, do you have any uh, interesting stories about Dale Anderson? A lot of these guys are from Michigan, you know. He's your high school teammate. You want a couple times? Oh, I got a lot of them. You got a lot of them. You know how to keep me here for a couple hours? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you getting some of this too or not? Because when I get done, I don't know if I want to do it anymore. <laughs> of course, got these young ladies here. I don't mind talking to them. <laughs> Dale Anderson also was uh, a national champion for Michigan State. Wrestled here, two-time, two-time state champion uh, from a little small town. I think uh, by uh, I think he wrestled. Before he came here, he wrestled down by Ames, small little town down there. Not sure all of his background, but he went to Iowa State for a year. It wasn't for him, but he was ahead of me two years. He won the state championships when I was a sophomore. He was a senior, a junior, a senior, and he went to Michigan State. And he's um, he loves Coach Sidney. He really loves Coach Sidney. He became a lawyer, and he's wrestled through college but he's got a book out and and he and he, he's done very well but I would say Dale Anderson for me I looked up to him because I was a 95 pound state champion lightest weight at the time as a sophomore and he was a 127 pound state champion so I never really wrestled him so then we went to college and we both kind of he was a couple years older maybe we both kind of uh, ended up being in the same weight class and by that time he had that mental edge on me that I had to get over, you know, and and so uh, we wrestled in the a tournament, Midlands tournament. I it was a tough match, I believe, and I think uh, I think I beat him in overtime. But it was like I was scared of him, you know, when you're scared of somebody, because I wouldn't even pick him out, you know, in, in the wrestling room I wouldn't went wrestle him at the time I was a 95 pounder. But but uh, so then. Coach Siddons calls me up and says, I'd like, to see, I'd like to have two national champs instead of just one between you and Anderson at this year's NCAAs. And he told me like 10 days before the, uh, the tournament. I'd already won the conference tournament 137, and he said, can you make 130? And I'm not even, he's my, my high school coach. And I said, well, I probably could. I don't know. It's really my have my weight down where I'm underweight every day. And he goes, well, I'd like to have two. So I said, well, okay, give me a couple days now. I'll, I'll just see if I can go down to 130. So that day I weighed out at 135. So I said, yeah, I'll go down to 130. But So he won the Nationals at 137, and you know, and I won the Nationals at 130, and that's probably the story that most that Coach Sins likes the most because he predicted we could do it. And he wanted two instead of one, and that's why he's the coach. Yeah. That's why he's the coach, you know. So, but I wasn't so sure because my first the first weigh-in was, the, you know, like whoa, I didn't recover right like I used to be. Like I told you how easy it is for me to recover. I didn't recover. So what I did was, I couldn't eat, but I drank. I remember, I remember this. Uh, this was 1968, uh, uh, March. And I remember going back to the hotel and I just drank a bunch of water and everybody else went out to eat. And I laid down. I slept for an hour and a half. We had five hour weigh-ins. When I woke up three and a half hours before the or three hours before the first match, I felt normal. <laughs> so then I went and ate and I was fine. So but it's kinda funny how you remember those things. At least I do, because it's been my whole life. Wrestling's been my whole life. And I've had my family on board, whether it was my first family or the family I've created all my whole life. And that's why I've, I'm able to be successful because I'm not going in all these di different directions. Wrestling 
and the family loves it because they've had so much fun with winning. 15 national twi titles, 21 out of 21 Big Ten titles. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. That's like taking this company here, going to the top and staying there forever. And no, nobody beating you out. I don't know if that's even possible. Do you have any competition? Yep. Okay. Are you already beating them out right now? We're getting there, yeah. Uh, getting there. Yeah, I didn't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There. So he's got to work on that a little bit. Anyway. So anything else? Did you guys ask me? Did I just still keep talking? I can't remember. Anybody ask me any questions that you want to know? You okay down there?